Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Football Fridays at the Eck. My name is Mike Sullivan. I'm with the Notre Dame Alumni Association, and we're so excited to have everybody back after a month between home games. And uh, what a beautiful day we have. We're excited today to have truly a Notre Dame legend, one of the most accomplished football players in the history of the university. Ken McAfee graduated from the university as a three-time All-American at tight end. He holds or held nearly every record for tight ends at the university. And this is a place known as Tight End U. Ken was a star on the 1977 National Championship team. He was an academic All-American, the Walter Camp Player of the Year, and finished third in the Heisman Trophy voting. After playing in the NFL, Ken graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, where he received multiple faculty appointments. Ken has served as a clinical associate professor at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where he's taught since 1995. And he's a widely published author and expert in his field. Ken was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1997 and continues to practice dental and oral surgery in Massachusetts, where he has a thriving practice. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have Ken here at Football Fridays. Let's give him a nice welcome. Thank you. These people don't even know who I am. Well, we're going to tell them. That's why we're here. We're going to tell them. So, Ken, let's first start with why you're here this weekend, and that's to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the 1977 National Championship team. Over 70 guys from that team are back for this weekend. That's pretty exciting. Wow. So, to okay. give everybody a little history lesson, in case you don't recall, there were no college football playoffs in 1977. It was the old bowl system. And so I want to ask you about your experience there. When you walked off the field in the Cotton Bowl, we had just beaten number one Texas 38 to 10. Did you guys think as you walked off the field that you were national champions at that point? We thought we certainly had uh, the right to profess that we were. But um, back in those days, um, you know, you have to be in, obviously today, you have to be in the top four to make the playoff system. Back then, we were ranked fifth going into that game. And every, all the teams above us lost their bowl game. So we beat Texas, who was the only undefeated team in the country that year. Um, you know, they had crappy teams like, you know, Earl Campbell and, you know, Russell Erksleib and Brad Sherry, you know. They, but, um, overrated. But, uh, overrated. But, uh, but we took care of them, and we, when we get into the locker room, you know, Dan Devine, who was our coach at the time, said... Uh, you know, we think we're the best team in the country, and we certainly are deserving of number one. And thankfully, they, they voted for us, you know. So in, in today's milieu, we wouldn't even have made the playoffs, and yet we won the national championship. So uh, The good old days, yeah. huh? The good old days, yeah. When men were men, right? <laughs> so maybe the most famous game from that uh, magical season was, of course, the game against USC, the Green Jersey game. So just talk a little bit about your memories of that game and, and other things that stand out from that championship run. Yeah, the, uh, that's, that course was a, a big impetus, I think, for us to, to go on and, and uh, become the national champs because the green jerseys were kind of like another, I think another Notre Dame lore will be, uh, they've worn, they've worn uh, green jerseys subsequently in, in some games, which it really hasn't had the impact that it did back in 1977. Um, so we all, we warmed up in our blue jerseys and we go back to the locker room, and I had kind of a superstition where I just wanted to be the last guy in the locker room and the last guy out on the field. So as we're going into the locker room, I'm walking up the stairs from the tunnel, and I just hear this crescendo of noise emanating from the locker room, and, it, and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And I go in, and guys are jumping around. They're throwing shirts around, and, and everyone's got green shirts on. And... I said, what the heck's going on here? And, and uh, so, long story short, you know, Dan Devine had placed a, a green jersey in everyone's locker. He, they, you know, everyone said, get those blue jerseys off, put the green ones on. And it was like we almost had won the game already. And, uh, you know, we were ranked 11th going into that game because we had lost to Mississippi, which was pathetic. But um, uh, USC had actually uh, played Alabama and had gone for two points and didn't get it, and they ended up losing Alabama 21 to 20 that. So they were ranked fifth in the country. We were ranked 11th. And after that game, we came out and 
149 to 19. Totally destroyed them. Of course, that was after we lost in 74, 55 to 24. So it was a good payback. But, uh, but uh, so that that's really was the, the big impetus. We, we carried that color, the, the green jersey, with us the rest of the year. And I was very, uh, very fortunate to, to go and had a guy named Montana at quarterback after that, which didn't hurt either. You know, so. Okay, so let's talk about, <laughs> you know, that uh, so many iconic moments, iconic players, and Joe Montana, the quarterback of that team. Uh, just share some thoughts. What made Montana so effective as a quarterback from your point of view? Uh, I think, you know, he was, he was a very low-keyed guy. He didn't, uh, you know, he, he wasn't very vociferous in the – in practice or in or in uh, games, but everyone knew what what kind of talent he had athletically, and he was just kind of one of these born leaders where you just follow him wherever he'll go. And um, so he would he never really started a game until the third game of the season. You know, after we came back against Purdue that year, we were losing 24 to 10, and they finally inserted Joe after things weren't going too well, and we beat him 31 to 24, and. After that, we never lost another game. So I think his athleticism, you know, really speaks for itself. And, and uh, I liked him a lot because he threw to me. So <laughs> <laughs> Easy guy to please. Yeah, so right. you actually played for three different starting quarterbacks in your career. And just talk a little bit about what it takes to build chemistry with a quarterback. How did that impact your career? Obviously, you had an incredible career, but with three different quarterbacks. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, as you progress through your career, you know, you, you – uh, really don't have any say as to who's playing quarterback. So, uh, you know, during practices, you just try to go out after practice, you know, for 20, 30 minutes and, and just have passes thrown to you and just, and just try to develop some kind of chemistry. And um, so that's what we did. We'd put a lot of extra time in, um, even during the off season. Um, and as a result, you know, you developed some kind of chemistry between you and, and it was able to, to go on and, and do great things. So you had referenced Coach Devine earlier. Of course, you were recruited out of Massachusetts by Eric Parsegian. Right. You played uh, for Coach Devine. Uh, just you know, compare and contrast a little bit the different styles of the two guys. Couldn't be two more different guys. Uh, Eric Parsegian was very, very vocal, you know, and, and just had his, had his head into everything, and he, he called the plays offensively, and uh, was just very motivating type of type of personality where. Dan Devine was kind of a little, little laid back, you know, and had kind of a high voice, and you know, was, it was uh, total different styles. But uh, the best thing about Dan Devine, he had a great, we had great assistant coaches who really uh, uh, knew their place, and um, you know, so we really, we were very fortunate to have a lot of those coaches. I think three of them ended up going on coaching the NFL, um, and Merv Johnson was our f offensive coordinator who uh, was at Oklahoma for a bunch of years, and uh, he was just great. So the assistant coaches really, I think, had more impact on us than Dan Devine, quite frankly. And there were a number of guys that were on Era's staff, and there was some continuity, wasn't there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you know, he kept a lot of the defensive coaches. Um, he, only, he only kept two offensive coaches, but, um, but that was a good transition for us, you know, and it really, it really kept the team glued together, I think. Yeah. So as we... Talked about three-time All-American at tight end, and now it's very common for people to refer to Notre Dame as tight end U. But this was the original guy at tight end U, <laughs> and now we've got another uh, incredible talent at that position in, in Michael Mayer. Who? He's Michael Mayer. Oh, maybe you yeah. you'll hear about him tomorrow. Didn't he, didn't and, he go to Harvard or something? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you a little bit about uh, coming back with heavy expectations placed on you. So as a three-time All-American, people, you were the go-to guy. You had a target on you for the other defenses. How'd you deal with that uh, high level of expectation? Uh, you know, it, it, a lot of guys that, uh, you know, that were playing at the time, we had, we, we had a great offense. We had Vegas Ferguson and, and uh, Jerome Heavens at, at back, and, and uh, we had some great wide receivers, Chris Haynes, um, Dave Wehmer, uh, all those guys ended up playing the NFL, so uh, we had a we had a pretty good pretty cohesive unit. So by running the ball back then, I mean the spread offenses they run today. You know, if, I keep telling you know everyone. I said, geez, if they had a spread offense back there, you know, I would have caught 500 passes. You know, but now uh, you know I was a tight end every position. I never split out. I never ran a reverse. I never 
I don't think I ran past 20 yards, you know, for a for pass reception. But um, I think it was the other the other components of our team uh, with the backs and and the other uh, receivers that we had, you know, made my job easier because I didn't get double teamed a whole lot. You know, I may, I keep telling my wife who knows nothing about football. I said, see that play you just run across the field 10 yards. That's how I was an All-American. I caught about 50 of those, you know, 10 yards and got ran for two, you know. <laughs> and that was about it. My average was like 12 yards a catch, you know, so. so have, you, a, have you had a chance to watch the team play much, and, and Mayer in particular? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's not bad, yeah. No, he's, uh, he's probably the best tight end I've seen uh, in, in college, um, you know, ever that I can, I can imagine. I mean, there's, there's, some, there's been some good ones along the way, but. I think Michael Mayer is probably the best tight end that, that's ever played college football that I can see. Yeah. yeah, let's give a nice round of applause. And I cry every Saturday as he breaks another one of my records. Yeah, so. Well, you know, no offense, but let's hope that uh, the, another, the touchdown record goes down tomorrow night. Yeah, That'd be uh, great. Yeah, but somebody else can score touchdowns. Right? <laughs> that's the only one yeah, I have left. Run the ball more, right? That's the only one I have left. Yeah, so. <laughs> Okay, we're going to open this up for questions in just a moment. I, I do want to uh, talk about some key decisions kind of in your life journey. Uh, grew up in Massachusetts and came out to the Midwest to play for ERA and the Irish. What led to that decision as a high school recruit? Why did you pick Notre Dame? Uh, you know, back in those days, uh, you had unlimited visits. You know, I think you only can have five visits to a uh, school these days. So I had like 20 visits lined up, and I, I went to 12 and I decided at that time, I, you know, it, this is getting a little old. I'm just going to schools just to have a good time on weekends. And, uh, you know, I came back. Once I visited Notre Dame, um, I found myself comparing Notre Dame to all the other schools that I attended to visit. And um, it just, there was no comparison. You know, Arab parts, you know, you go, you go to a lot of different schools and they offer you all kinds of things. And um, I came to Notre Dame and Aris, you know, sat at his desk and he was a lefty. So he said, uh, you know, Nice to meet you, Ken. Now, what's your height? What's your weight? What's your 40 time? He said, uh, how you doing academically? So he, got, so he leans back in his chair. He said, I just want to get a couple of questions out of the way. He goes, I can offer you two things. I can offer you an opportunity to win the national championship and the best education in, in America. He said, if you want it, we'll offer you a full scholarship. If not, good luck to you. I said, OK, thanks. That was, that was basically it, you know? And uh, you know, of course, some other schools, you had, you know, Couple of other opportunities that I, I won't mention, but um, you know, the, once once you know he's a very matter of fact guy, and and of course they were coming off a national championship in 1973, which didn't hurt either. Um, and on my recruiting trip here, uh, we couldn't even fly into South Bend because it was in I think it was in February and it was snowing and raining and cloudy, so we had to get on a bus. There was about 30 recruits that week, um, so we got on a bus in. Chicago and drove here. We got here about one in the morning. And uh, I said to the coach, I said, is the weather always like this? He goes, no, no, it's like 80 every day. This is just a bad, bad day. So I said, so that weekend we went to, uh, they played Michigan Tech in hockey, who was the defending national champs, and Notre Dame beat them in hockey. We, we went to the UCLA basketball game, who had won 88 games in a row, and Notre Dame beat them uh, by one point in that game. And uh, I I uh, asked my Mike Creaney, who was a tight end at the time. He was my host. And I said, wow, this is exciting. He goes, magnify this by 10 and you have a football game. I said, all right, where do I sign up? You know, so so uh, then they had the national championship uh, uh, honorees uh, awarded that, at, uh, that weekend as well because we couldn't fly out on Sunday because it was still snowing and raining and, and just altogether crappy here. And so that's why I said to myself, you know, I went to visit Alabama and, I, you know, it's 80 degrees and sunny. I said, this is nice. I went to USC. This is great, you know. And the coach brings you out into the middle of the field in the Coliseum. He goes, look at this. Wouldn't you like to have 100,000 people look at you? And I said, all right. Then Ken McAfee, number 81, comes on the board in the Coliseum and music starts playing. I said, this is, this is a little too Hollywood for me, you know? So I said, Coach, I can't come here. He said, why not? I said, have you looked around campus? All these blonde-headed girls with the little shorts and the t I'd never go to school. So I, 
I'm going to go back to South Bend. Well, well there's, there's guys at school. That's all. It was. <laughs> well, it worked out great for, uh, certainly for Notre Dame, and uh, I think it worked out okay for you yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, and we're glad you made that choice. So after the, an amazing career, drafted seventh overall in the NFL draft in 1978 by the 49ers, and not a lot of tight ends go in the top ten, right? In, in the, the last 50 years, it's only happened, this is one of ten guys to be drafted at that position in the top ten. So really an amazing accomplishment. Goes to the 49ers, a guy named Montana's there too, and after two successful years, I would say personally, you were a starter, you caught multiple touchdown passes at tight end, but then you walked away from an NFL career to go to dental school. Walk us through that thought process a little. Well, the, uh, you know, we had three coaches in two years in the NFL, you know, which is, it, it brings it back down to the level where it is a business, you know, and, and it loses a little bit of the fun aspect of it. You know, in college, you know, you couldn't be more fun. Uh, when you go to the pros, everyone talks about it being a business. That's exactly what it is. So, you know, when you have you have one coach that that is high on you, then he get he got fired halfway through the season. We had the offensive coordinator as the head coach, and then they fired him at the end of the season. And then Bill Walsh came in as a head coach and put in the West Coast offense, which is like the origination of the spread offense, which a lot of teams run these days. And um, he said, you know, we're not going to really use the tight end a lot. You know, so I, I think you're a great blocker. You know, you could be an all-pro guard. I like to move you inside to guard. I said, Bill, I lost more games my first year in the pros than I lost in high school and college combined. I said, I'm not going to go inside for this team. I said, you're not going anywhere. Of course, the next year they won the Super Bowl. Now, it shows you how smart I am, right? But... Um, so I just, I, I just decided, I said, look, I'm just going to go back to, to dental school and finish, uh, finish school. And that was kind of the end of that. But then uh, a year later, um, my receiver coach who was at San Francisco um, was actually coaching the, with the uh, Minnesota Vikings. So he asked me if I wanted to come back. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'm still only 25 years old. I'm, I might give it a try. So I went back and played for the Vikings for a couple of years. I got a bad back injury. And so I said, uh, the heck with that. I'm, I'm all done, you know. So I went back and finished and finished uh, dental school and then went on to become, uh, went on another, on a residency to become an oral maxillofacial surgeon. So that's where it stands today, you know. So it's well, a lot, lot safer. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about how your Notre Dame degree prepared you to take on those challenges and, and you know, be a healthcare professional and be very successful in that field. Yeah, you know, it was... Uh, really unprecedented because uh, one thing Ara did tell me when I was recruited, he said that, uh, you know, academics is first here. If you have a class, you're going to be late to practice. It's not a problem. And so I left his office and said, yeah, sure, yeah, we'll see that. Yeah. So there was about, there was three of us. We had uh, chemistry lab uh, on Wednesday afternoons that didn't get out until about 3 o'clock. And so we were late going to practice. The three of us are running on the field. And there's about 20 guys coming toward us running off the field. They say, where are you guys going? You know, we have an accounting exam. You know, so, so it really was true that you know, academics takes precedence over athletics uh, at Notre Dame, which I don't think can be said for a lot of other schools these days. And um, that was really, uh, really something that uh, really drove you uh, academically as well as athletically, you know, because you had that. You had the coaches having your back and not forcing you to do things athletically that, uh, that are unwarranted. Do you have a few minutes for questions? Oh, sure. All right. How I about got, we'll turn it over to the audience? I have all day. You don't want to say that to this crowd. You're <laughs> never going to get out of here. Okay. As things change and time goes on, what advice do you feel like stands the test of time? Like what would you give to a current student athlete? Uh, I would just say the same thing that was, that was given to me, you know, that uh, academics takes priority. Athletics is fleeting. You know, and I played, I ended up playing for three years in the NFL, um, you know, and don't have great memories of it. You know, my memories are, are based right here. You know, I mean, every time I come back to campus, um, which becomes somewhat un unrecognizable every time I come back, there's always a new building someplace. But, um, you know, it, Athletics is fleeting, and it's what have you done for me lately? You know, if you, if, if you have a bad game or a couple of bad games, you're done. 
you know, and, and uh, no one remembers you, no one really cares. And you have to offer yourself, not only yourself something, but something for, you know, your community or, or, or humanity, you know. And um, so that's, that's one of the reasons, you know, I, ch I chose to go into uh, oral surgery, you know, because it was, it was something that I'd go into the operating room when I was like 20 years old doing an internship. And, uh, you know, see these operations being, I said, you know, that's what I want to do. So, not only do you feel some, you feel some kind of sense of, of accomplishment by helping people, um, rearranging their face occasionally rather than being on the football field and smashing their face. So, um, so that's, a, that's the thing that I would say, you know, it's, it's just, you got to do something with your life after athletics anyway, right? So, when I was playing, we didn't make that much money anyway. Seventh player picked in the 78 draft, I made $60,000 my first year. After paying California taxes, federal taxes, tuition for school, I had like $1,500 left in my account. I said, this isn't that great. You know, <laughs> what the heck is this? You know? <laughs> okay, another question. Obviously, uh, Ara Pasijan was uh, one of the greatest coaches ever. In a few words, what would, what would you describe as making him such a great coach and such a great man? I think, uh, you know, his, his ability to communicate to the players particularly, and we never, I never heard him swear once uh, when, I was in, when I was there my first year. And, um, you know, you could, you could see Brian Kelly, they had to cut away from him a few times when he was coach, but, <laughs> was, uh, but he, was just, he was just a great guy. He was very motivating, very matter of fact, and he, he just had an exuberance about how you just love the guy. And um, actually, I shouldn't say that because he said at halftime at Purdue, my freshman year, he goes, you guys better get going or you're going to get your asses beat. So that's the only time I heard him say anything. Like, <laughs> but, but just a, a great guy, a great coach, and, and uh, could never say anything enough, enough about him. I just, when I just only had to play for, him for a year. I mean, I wish I had been able to play my entire career with him, but the one thing we were practicing one day, and I heard this guy, McAfee, and I'm looking around at my position coach, and he, I said, he's going, McAfee, and the coach goes, he points up like this, he's up on his tower, and I look up on him, and he says, what the hell are you doing? He goes, get that guy, get that linebacker on that play, and I, I looked at my position coach, I said, he actually knows my name. It's like, it's like God yelling at you from coming. <laughs> yeah. You should have screwed up more often. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, jeez. Anybody else? In the back. Yeah. Look at this guy over here. With the glove. With the receiver glove on. Ken, uh, Mike mentioned the Purdue game. I recall you guys being down... Rusty Lish starts the second half. Right. He gets he goes out. Forrestek gets hurt. Lish comes back in. Right. Then it's, you know, when Montana came in, the whole team kind of gelled and rallied around. What was that moment like? And then you guys went on, of course, to win the national championship. Yeah. No, that was. Uh, now there's a guy who knows his stuff. See that? <laughs> yeah. That was. Uh, no, everyone knew that Joe had the athletic ability. You know, we kind of rallied around him. There was a big. There's always been some kind of a quarterback controversy over the years with a Notre Dame quarterback. And so, you know, everyone thought, you know, that Rusty Liss should be starting. And then there was another faction that thought Joe should be starting, you know, particularly after the sophomore year when we, he came in three times and brought us from the jaws of defeat, you know. So um, we all, I mean, I was thankful that he came in and, and everyone else, like you said, just rallied around him because he was just kind of a silent type guy and we just let his, let his athleticism talk for itself. But um, he's just a great guy, great athlete, and a great teammate. Okay, how about one more question here? What was your favorite game? My favorite game? You know, I got, at the, I got asked that a lot. It's tough to answer. But... Um, I think probably the USC game uh, senior year because we had lost to them three years in a row after leading them three years in a row. So uh, I think that was, 
that was a great moment that uh, we finally able to to beat them by a substantial margin too. You know, right and right here at home, in front of all our fans. And uh, you always have to connect that game to the Texas game when we played in the Cotton Bowl because, uh, as I said, they're the only undefeated team in the country, and we we handled them pretty well. So, uh, so those I think those two games, as far as college, is probably the two best memories that I have. Yeah. Okay, Ken, thank you so much. It's been oh, great sure. having you back on right. campus. Thank you. Ha have a great weekend with your teammates yeah. and celebrate yeah. your championship. Yeah. Appreciate it very much. One more round of applause for yeah. Ken McAfee. Go Irish. Yeah.